Well, good evening, and welcome to our Monday night study of First Corinthians. And we are in the second session where we're going to explore chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Cor Corinth was like a combination of New York, Las Vegas, and Hollywood, all wrapped up in one. In the previous session, we covered the whole geopolitical thing. And, but also the word Corinthian and the word fornicator became synonymous. So a Corinth, to call someone a Corinthian is an epithet. And it's because of that usage there, to get that across, I often call this First Californians, chapter one, uh, I mean the session two, uh, chapter two. So uh, that's my tongue in my cheek, of course, but to someone from America, it communicates. It gives you a feeling what Corinth, Corinth was very blessed geopolitically, and that made it very prosperous. But along with that came all the rest of it. So we, in the, in the previous session, we went through the whole geopolitical background. So I invite you to review your notes on that. But we'll focus on the occasion of this particular letter. You need to understand <clears throat> that there were actually four letters and three visits. And it gets confused unless you really study it. There are four letters. The first visit was when the church, of course, was founded. Then there was a letter that's alluded to, but it's been lost, which is known as the previous letter. It's alluded to, but we lost it. Then we get to this letter, which we know as 1 Corinthians. You could say technically it's the second one because we've lost the first one, but I don't, it's going to get confusing enough even as it is. That was followed by what's called the painful visit. Because of the disruptions and things that led to the first letter, uh, there was what was called the painful visit. And that, it followed, that, what followed that was the severe letter. Again, a letter that was lost. And then we finally get to 2 Corinthians, and, uh, which was followed by a visit after 2 Corinthians had been sent. So we actually have a series of four letters that are alluded to, but we're exploring 1 Corinthians in this particular session. And uh, the household of Chloe brought Paul news of cliques in the church. And the church wrote him a letter, presumably brought by uh, to Ephesus by Stephanas, Fortunas, and Archaeus. And uh, they probably added their own comments. But it was that, uh, that news that caused Paul to write this letter. The situation was very serious. And so Paul's responding to this letter that we know as 1 Corinthians. But there's a history that precedes it, obviously. We covered all that in the first session. This is why, by way of review. But one of the main topics that occurred in chapter 1 that I wanted us to be have in focus is this, what I like to call the ultimate oxymoron. Paul uses the term, the foolishness of God. You wonder how you could put those two words together. You can't think of God as being foolish, but uh, he alludes to the foolishness of God. What is he talking about? It's strange, but we need to notice that God seems to go out of his way to do things in a strange way. Uh, Noah is going to have the flood. He has Noah build, spent 120 years building this barge, right? Genesis, uh, uh, and we have the uh, 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 Samson and the jawbone of an ass in Judges 15. We have Elisha and the name of the leper, this strange event in 2 Kings 5. And Moses and the brazen serpent. You've heard me speak of that many times. And, uh, and of course, Jonah and the big fish. God seems to choose strange metaphors. And yet we discover almost every one of these really points to the Messiah in some way or another. But the ultimate foolishness, the ultimate of all of these things, is that the entire universe would be resolved by a wooden cross erected in Judea. That becomes the central fulcrum of the history of the entire universe. And that's why we title <coughs> our study of Isaiah 53 just that way. And so, but we're in chapter 2, and the first five verses really pick up on where we left off last time with the foolishness of God. It summarizes and completes that foolishness discourse that, uh, that uh, Paul indulges in. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. And uh, so... He's, he is not making an exception of himself. He learned his lesson in Athens, if you will, back in Acts 17. And uh, 
the, uh, he, he had conformed to what he had been saying about the foolishness of the God here to the Corinthians. Preaching the gospel is not delivering edifying discourses beautifully put together. It is bearing witness to what God has done in Christ for our salvation. That's a very important distinction. We don't strive for eloquency. We strive for the declaration of what God has done. Very, very important. He's going to hammer that pretty hard uh, in these verses here. Paul continues, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now that's rather startling, because here's a guy that was probably one of the most educated people on the planet Earth at the time. He was schooled in Tarsus. Tarsus was a, a, a literary center that rivaled Alexandria in those days. That's where he learned his Greek. He also learned his Hebrew from Gamaliel, Gamaliel himself. So he, he was probably the most credentialed guy, and his family was wealthy. They were freemen. They, he was actually a Roman citizen. That come, You discover that later on. Comes as a big surprise to the Roman soldiers. Um, here's a guy with resources. And very, very educated. And yet, it's interesting to see his focus, because he's going to hammer this in this letter. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And uh, so he excluded everything but the one great central truth, which he calls the gospel. Fair enough. I often am tempted with a class to have you take out a piece of paper and you tell me what is the gospel. Define it for me. Some will say, well, that's the good news. That's a cop-out answer. No, what is the gospel? And uh, so that's the question that I want us to consider because I suspect that probably one Christian in ten would get it right. Paul defines the gospel for us in the first four verses of a later chapter, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. It's a chapter which God would argue, I should say Jesus would argue, is the most essential chapter to the Christian of all the chapters there. But here he defines the gospel. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. He, see, he's declaring it in this passage. Which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. That's a disturbing phrase. Can you believe in vain? Apparently. Apparently. And that's what the overcomer passage is. The seven, Jesus refers to that seven times in his epistles. But moving on here, he continues now to define the gospel for our benefit. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now don't let the familiarity of that uh, hide the significance of that. That's the Gospel. Three things. That He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He didn't disappear. He didn't just die most documented death on the planet Earth. And he fulfilled dozens of precise specifications in that death. Even though the manner of death hadn't been invented back then, until, I mean, until several, seven centuries later. That he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. Again, according to the Scriptures, everything about, his, about the Gospel was pre-specified when? When was it pre-specified? The answer is before the foundation of the world. This was an arrangement between the Father and the Son, before the foundation of the world. Three things, that he died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he's buried, rose again the third day. And of course he died in the most documented execution in history, and uh, we've mentioned that. It's interesting that even such details like not a bone is to be broken of the Passover lamb. Remember that John the Baptist introduces Jesus at the beginning of his ministry as the lamb, that, uh, the Passover lamb that uh, died for the sins of the world. But not a bone is to be broken. You find that in Exodus 12, Numbers 9, Psalm 34, and other allusions. A Roman soldier actually violated his orders. 
He didn't follow through. If he did what he was ordered to do, that wouldn't have happened. That, that would, have been, would have been broken. Interesting. I don't think the Roman soldier was realizing that he was fulfilling prophecy by disobeying his supervision. And he was buried. Now here again, only Paul emphasizes that as the gospel. He was buried. Again, fulfilling precise requirements. It startled me to discover when I was doing my homework for my Leviticus commentary, among the many commentaries, that the, this, the pivotal one in that world is one by Andrew Bonar. Andrew Bonar, in his classic work on the book of Leviticus, describes the burial requirements for the Messiah. But what's astonishing when you read Andrew Bonar's details you may overlook the fact that his, his um, commentary was published in 1840. That's 43 years before General Charles Gordon in, uh, discovers the Garden Tomb in 1883. When you read Bonar, and if you've visit, visited Israel and seen the Garden Tomb, it fits amazingly well. And it's astonishing to realize that Bonar described it strictly from the biblical text. Interestingly enough, and uh, so, uh, and if you've been there, it's it's it's, it's really amazing. I, I happen to believe that it really is the tomb. They don't sell it that way. They don't want to oversell it, but it, there's about 18 specific scriptural tie-ins to the thing. But it's interesting that uh, uh, this chapter that we're dealing with here, chapter 15 is the very chapter that Paul regards as the most important chapter in the Bible. And you think it's exaggerating that in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, from verses 13 to 19, he says as much, that without this chapter we have nothing. It's a very interesting form of emphasis. But then, of course, of the three things, we now get to the capstone. That he rose from the dead, again fulfilling numerous specifications, that embroider the entire Old Testament. You find that laced all through the Old Testament, by the way. And uh, this third element, he died, buried, now he rose again the third day from the Scripture, is the very capstone of what Paul defines as the Gospel. And I think it's important to know because one of the shocking things you discover as you travel, especially in America, but I think elsewhere too, how hard it is to find a church that preaches the Gospel. They get all wrapped up in social issues, worthwhile issues, abortion, same-sex marriage, all kinds of issues, but that's not the gospel. And pursuing those issues can be at the expense of our calling, which is to make him, the person, known, the person of Christ. And so this third day thing is interesting. Where in... In the Old Testament, does it describe, see it says he, he, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The quiz question that you should imagine being confronted with is where in the Old Testament does it require the three days in the tomb? And most of you will quickly remember that in Matthew 12, 40, Jesus himself identifies it for you. The story of Jonah. As Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man spend three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Jesus' own words, very specific, and there are three days and three nights. We're not after counting hours, we're not playing games, it's very, very forthright. But is that the only place? And my challenge to my classes is find six more in the Old Testament. Well, there's the Akedah. It turns out when you study Genesis 22, Isaac was dead to Abraham when the commandment came, according to Hebrews 11:19. And so uh, the Akedah turns out to portray that also. And Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy. That's why he names the place in the Mount of the Lord shall be seen. You can spend a whole session just studying that chapter in the way it uh, anticipates uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. N Noah's new beginning. The Holy Spirit tells you in Genesis, the fourth verse of Genesis 8 that the ark came to rest on the 17th day of the seventh month and, uh, and uh, when you get into all of that, you discover, you have to get into the calendar, you discover that, no, that Noah's new beginning is on the anniversary in advance of our new beginning in Christ. And the orchestration of that is worth chasing down. It's really quite interesting. Rahab's cords in Joshua chapter 2 is another one. The, uh, 
the whole idea that when she meant, speaks of the cord to the two spies, she uses the word hebel, which means cord, but it also can mean pain, suffering, and so on. When they respond to her, they use the term tikva, another word that means cord, but the word tikva it means hope. Ha tikva is the national anthem of Israel, the hope. Between those two verses, from verse 15 and 18, she tells them to go hide for three days before going back. Why three days? Why not four? Why not two? Because there are three days between the trauma of Golgotha and the exhilaration of the empty tomb. And so it's, it's tucked away in, in the, you say, Chuck, you're making it something out. That's up to you. You check it out. When Jesus hangs on the cross, according to Psalm 22, 6, he says, I am a worm. And he uses the word tola. Well, you need to under, go into a biology test and understand the tola worm and how it operates. The larva is attached to a tree. It provides the red dye. That they, that's where they get the red dye. And it's that way for three days when it turns white and flakes off. And you're reminded of Isaiah 1.18, Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as wool. And there's a handful of others, and they'll be in your notes. In Genesis 40, 20, Exodus 19, Leviticus 7, Hosea 6, or just a number of others. I'll leave it to you. They're six times, apparently, in, the, in Luke. Okay. What's amazing to me is what, Jesus, what Paul does not include in the gospel. What does he not include? He makes no mention of the Lord's teachings. I'm not disparaging them, but that's not the gospel. Doesn't mention his miracles, can you imagine? Makes no mentions of his example. These are not the gospel. I'm not disparaging, don't misunderstand me. I'm trying to elevate the core issues that Paul is focusing on. Our basic calling, yours and mine, is to declare the gospel. You're not there to sell anything. You're not there to convince anything. You declare the gospel. The saving of the person is the job of the Holy Spirit, not yours. It's amazing how few people realize it. Our basic calling is to declare the gospel. And this differentiates us from pending social issues of the day. I'm not saying that those issues shouldn't be addressed, but realize that when you address those issues, you may be doing it at the expense of the gospel. Paul and the disciples did not try to eliminate slavery in the Roman Empire. There are all kinds of abuses and things that should have been corrected. They could deal with, but they didn't. They focused on the de de declaring the person that we call the Messiah. And that's, that was their focus. And in today's world, it's very easy for these other ish issues to derail us from what we're called to do. Now, that's a very controversial point of view. That's a very, that's, this is not a popular view, but this is the primary calling for us. And it may be our focus on this that causes us to get persecuted by the denominational churches, as J. Vernon McGee and others have, have prophesied. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In other words, it's Jesus and the fact that He was crucified. And he excluded everything but this great central truth. But then he continues, he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Or as the Phillips translation does, I was feeling far from strong, I was nervous and rather shaky, is the way Phillips renders it, which is descriptive. See, Paul had much to discourage him before he arrived at Corinth. And even the Lord himself encouraged him. He endured physical ailments. He endured punishment and affliction. And that's detailed in 2 Corinthians 11. There's a whole chronicle of all of that in there that we'll get it in a subsequent session. He was ill in Galatia, Galatia 4, probably having to do with his eyes, we suspect. Of, he was of small stature, we gather, and he had very poor eyesight. Again, we think that may be tied to his... Um, his uh, some people speculate that it might be an aftermath of his Damascus Road experience. But uh, there is some records that suggest that he was not impressive in appearance. A man of small of stature, a bald head and crooked legs and a good state of body, with eyebrows meeting and a nose somewhat crooked. And that's extracted from people who feel that they've had some insights there. I'll, I'll leave that up to you. I, don't, I wouldn't push it hard. Verse 4. 
And Paul continues, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now the word spirit here appears for the first time, and it'll, it, uh, um, the, the last word is always power, always associated with the Spirit. And uh, in not enticing words. Now the word there in the Greek means persuasive, demonstration, the most rigorous proof. It says, my preaching was not with persuasive demonstrations. Not at all. Paul's very defects had afforded the most convincing demonstration of the power of the Spirit, is his point. And the notes, the, the references will be in your notes there. And uh, the expositional teach, preaching of the Word, of course, is the emphasis that he gives his protege, uh, Timothy, in his final letter to Timothy. He emphasizes that. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul's intention had been to ground his converts in the divine power and to make them independent of human wisdom. See, the, the fa fallacy is if you win some by a clever argument, there's also another more clever argument than can disconnect them, if that's your basis. No, he didn't, he didn't want to do that at all. Faith that depends upon clever reasoning can be demolished by a more acute argu argument. Faith produced by the power of God can never be overthrown. So you don't base your argument on man's wisdom or man's logic, but on the power of God. Very, very important emphasis here. And the more you study it, the more surprising it really is. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Now the word perfect here means mature. It's an old use of the, the, of the King James thing. Poor, full development, growth, and the maturities we speak with. We speak among them that are complete or mature. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. See, Paul distinguishes between Christians who have accepted the wisdom of the cross and outsiders who have not. Okay, he's going to make that distinction very emphatic as we continue here. Now, this perfect means mature. Spiritual maturity is the moment-by-moment -moment acceptance of God's wise provision. Even if the world sees it as folly, the world will see us as fools. The New Testament writers do not envisage grades of Christians. All believers should grow to maturity. Failing to grow to maturity is the real burden of the whole epistle to the Hebrews. Many people misunderstand Paul's epistle to the Hebrews because they don't understand what the real issue there, that's to go to maturity. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, not of the wisdom of this world, uh, nor of the princes of this world and uh, the rulers of this age. The unseen world found in Paul's writings, you see that all through in Romans 8, Colossians 2, and in the second Corinthian letter also. However, this reference may not be demonic. It may be rulers of this world in the, in the more common sense. That's in the failure of human wisdom, the crucifiers of Christ. And so I'm not denying it may be also including demonic, but it may not even be reaching that far. Ignorance is not ascribed to demons. So don't make that mistake. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, God, uh, it was ordained before the ages, is what it says. The gospel was not an afterthought. It was planned before time began. You can find that emphasized in Ephesians 1.4. That's when did God first start thinking about you, personally. Before he created the world, he had you on his mind. And that's echoed in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3. Colossians 1 elsewhere. And this word ordained or destined, if you will, means foreordained by God, not by man. And for our glory, a supernatural destiny, of course. And, he, and Paul picks that up in Romans 8, 18. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of Christ. That's the reason I think the princes of this world, he refers to people, not demons, because demons are not ignorant, so to speak. 
That's why I, I leaned that way in interpreting that previous verse, which none of the princes of the world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of Christ. And Jesus himself verifies that. They know not what they do, he, he declares, right? And Jesus himself says so in Luke 23. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's quite a title. The loftiest title ever applied. Only here, by the way, James 2 has a very similar label. The mysteries of God are hidden from the unsaved world. Let that sink in for a minute. We overlook that so often. When we're talking to someone who's not saved, we need to understand that the mysteries of God are hidden from them until they're saved. In other words, it's not an intellectual process going on. It's a spiritual process that's going on. It's so easy to forget in our enthusiasm and whatever. No, the mysteries of God are hidden from the unsaved world. That's a reality we need to grasp. And he's going to deal with that here in the next handful of verses. He says, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, we always see that verse in the positive sense. as a declaration of wonderfulness. And indeed, it is. Don't misunderstand me. But there's a dark side of that, too. You see? Because we can't see or hear from our own heart what God has prepared. It's, it's a supernatural process that takes place, if you will. And that's all through the Old Testament. The Spirit's wisdom applies to the believer's life today. And uh, you know, neither have entered into the heart of man. And the word there in the Greek is cardia. It's not heart in the, in the, in the muscular sense. It's a mind or inner life ter term referring to the, 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 uh, the inner life, if you will. Probably the best way to express it. And, uh, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. And uh, so the Spirit's been mentioned so far, uh, but uh, in the next few verses it'll be six more times for a total of seven. Not that that's a big deal, but it's provocative to me. And uh, the deep things, the deep things of God. What do you mean by deep? Unfathomable. They're beyond our measuring its depth. The only person who can tell us about God is the Spirit of God. Anything else is spurious. How easy it is to forget that. Have God he revealed to them under his spirit. That takes away all suggestion of superiority. There is no room for pride in that sentence. It is God's initiative and his completion. It was re God hath revealed them to us by a spirit. We didn't do it. He did it. And he did all of it. We didn't add anything to it. He's, he's setting a case here because he's going to take them to task for their pride and their, their, the cliches, the divisions that, that are prevalent in the Corinthian church. He's going to deal with what we call the transfer process from verses 9 through 15. We have described the process by which a truth passes from the mind of God to the mind of his people. Wow. Wow. That's heavy stuff. And uh, so, it's undiscoverable by natural man. How, is, how easy it is for us to forget that. We may know it intellectually, but we don't apply it. Spirit-taught words are an infallible guide. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. And um, full deity is given to the spirit here, by the way, but there's no... Uh, you know, issue there. And there's an analogy drawn here from the nature of man, if you will. And so that's fine. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And again, we, notice the plural there, and speaking of we Christians have received, not the spirit of the world, and that's, the, that's, the, that's what's in opposition to God's spirit, the name is Satan. The spirit of this world is in opposition to the spirit of God. There's a tension between them. 
We need to understand that too. The Holy Spirit, and one of the things you should do in your studies is set aside some space and collect your notes to really understand the Holy Spirit. We won't try to exhaust that here. We'll give you just a couple of touch places. The Holy Spirit indwells us and makes us His temple. 1 Corinthians 6. We'll elaborate that when we get there. The Holy Spirit baptized us into what we call the body of Christ. And that'll be expanded in 1 Corinthians 12. He seals us. And this is the, perhaps the most exciting aspect of the Holy Spirit. It's an aspect that Paul did not learn from Gamaliel, from, from, Gamaliel the, uh, from the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, he wasn't, he, they weren't sealed. One of the things he is, uh, was uh, privileged to reveal in Ephesians 3, he points out that it was his privilege to discover and describe that the Holy Spirit has a relationship with us that is unique to us. It, it started after John the Baptist, and it goes until the Harpazo, the rapture, that we are sealed. And he's given without repentance, staggering steps. And it, 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 we encounter it in Ephesians 1 and following. And the Holy Spirit will remain with us, and Jesus announces that in John 14. In fact, he has to be, Jesus had to leave in order to make that fully uh, implemented. And it's freely given to us. That speaks of liberty in 2 Corinthians. And not of bondage. So we could go on and on and on about the Holy Spirit. And it's not an easy thing because the Holy Spirit rarely testifies of Himself. You have to draw that out from, from the text. Verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Comparing spiritual with spiritual. It's amazing how you can get nonsensical comparisons if you're not cautious. And uh, to give you a silly example, is it colder in Alaska or in November? I'm speaking Northern Hemisphere here, I apologize. See, I mean, obviously those are non sequiturs because you're not comparing like with like. And we, we should guard, you want to compare spiritual things with spiritual at this point. The Spirit makes all the difference. And uh, because the Holy Spirit is the one that makes the difference, that's one reason we, uh, we have here a bold use of the subjective genitive. We are to pass on, not by, worldly words, but those words taught by the Spirit. Not based on human thinking, man's wisdom, and so forth. And that's the reason, um, see, Paul's style, vocabulary, diction, syntax, were all vehicles of the truth that the Spirit taught him. Okay? That's the reason we used a flame over the word in our logo for the publishing activity. That's where that came from. But then verse 14 is one of your memory verses. You know, as you go through these chapters, there will be something that leaps out that you want to make a key verse. This is one of them. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. You know, it's interesting that uh, the, uh, in fact, let's just go look at, look at this another way. Spiritual things are meaningless, irrelevant, foolish, and have no place in a life that's limited to the present world. Unbelievers are unable to judge spirituality spiritually because they themselves are dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2.1. Okay. Before conversion, you can look at scriptures and you can admire the grandeur. You can feel the charm of the history. You can wonder at the majesty of the language, but you'll miss the intent. You'll miss the intent. That's before conversion. After you have the Holy Spirit, divine life quickens each page to illuminate the inner meaning shining forth. And that's something you've got to experience. And when you experience it, you'll know it. And uh, so we could go on and on on that thing. Now this leads, this implies a couple of special topics. Those of you that are regulars to our study, this may be old news. Those of you may, may be new to this study, there's a couple of areas that you want to sort of backfill a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about the natural man, a little bit about the geometry of eternity, and a little bit about the physics of software. 
because this is all tangled up in what we're talking about here. The natural man. We speak of, we have a vocabulary. We speak of the soul and the spirit and such. We use those words very sloppily, okay? But it's interesting that in the epistle of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12, there's a huge insight that we want to extract for ourselves. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. That gives you a huge insight that only the Word of God can discern the distinction between soul and spirit. We may use those terms loosely, sloppily, but they are different. The spirit and the soul and spirit are different things. Only the Word of God can make that discernment. And that leads to another insight. Dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. And uh, only the Word of God can differentiate between these two. The soul and the spirit. That means that psychology is doomed to frustration. Because psychology can only deal with the symptoms, not the cause. They, have, they do not have the ability to discern the difference between the soul and the spirit. And uh, see, the heart itself is part of the issue here. It can't be known, we're told from Jeremiah 17, 9. Let's realize that. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately, the word is actually incurably wicked. Who can know it? See, these things are software, not hardware problems. That gets to something else I want to get into. No matter how much you may know about a computer hardware, you have no insight into its behavior, with the exception of a physical problem of some kind. And uh, that's, the natural, that's a software issue. No matter how much you know about neurophysiology, you don't have the knowledge to predict behavior. That's a software issue, not a hardware issue. In an infant, in, we know from Turing, and now from, uh, from uh, John von Neumann and Alan Turing's work, that an infinite state machine you cannot predict the behavior or infer, infer the design architecture from the external operation. An infinite state machine cannot be inferred from the outside. You have to know the design. And that's a fundamental, that's why that's com a computer is by definition an infinite state machine. That's why a software industry is feasible. You can use a software but you can't gain the design insights. You can go from high level compilers to machine code but not the other way around normally. And uh, so this is one of the reasons that the field of psychology is doomed to frustration. They are trying to infer the internal system design while being restricted to its external behavior. That's the fundamental, fundamental dilemma of the psychology of the psychiatrist, is they, they can only guess. There is part of you that is not physical. The real you is software, not hardware. You are temporarily resident in a hardware environment. But it transcends the limitation of that environment. That gets into the geometry of eternity. We want to rid ourselves of some misconceptions. I think it'll help. Time is neither linear nor absolute. Time is a physical property. We now recognize, thanks to Dr. Einstein's general theory of relativity, that we exist in a four-dimensional continuum known as space-time. And a, a time measurement device in a weaker gravitational field runs faster than one in a stronger field. Near the surface of the Earth, the frequency increases about one part in 10 to the 16th per meter. A clock 100 meters higher uh, than a second clock will have a frequency higher by one part in 10 to the 40. Not very much, but it's, me it's measurable, it's predictable, and, uh, and confirmed. Time, the point is, Time varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity. Is God subject to time, mass, acceleration, and gravity? The answer is no. God, eternity is not having lots of time. Eternity is being outside the restrictions of time altogether. Big difference. The other makes a nice poetry, but it's wrong, bad physics. God is outside time, so He alone knows the end from the beginning. And He uses that aspect to authenticate his messages by proving that they originate from outside time. Not by divination. Divination was prohibited in the Torah. Divination is trying to predict the future. We want to understand it to understand God's plan and his program. But we want to understand it so that when it occurs, 
we celebrate who he is because he's anticipated it. And that's why um, the Lord can tell Nicodemus that as Moses raised this serpent in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be raised up. Because that ties together the reality that Christ's mission was anticipated more than a thousand years before in Numbers 21. The tie together and so forth. And the dilation of time can be dramatized by considering two hypothetical chronostants. One remains on the earth, the other undertakes a space mission in which the vehicle attains a speed at half the speed of light. En route to, say, Alpha Centauri, which is the nearest star. You go to Alpha Centauri and back. And when our traveler returns to the earth, he will be more than two years younger than his twin brother. That, that, if that doesn't bother you, you weren't listening carefully. Okay. These examples simply highlight that time itself is a physical property in our material world. Once you understand that, it really simplifies some of your, your uh, Bible uh, insights issues. Software, by the way, has no mass. Its embodiment may. The light switch, whether it's on or off, doesn't weigh any different. Okay. Software doesn't have any mass. The information, whether ones and zeros, itself has no weight. Its embodiment may. You take a blank diskette, you can load it with over a million bytes of software costing hundreds of dollars, and it'll still weigh only seven tenths of an ounce. It doesn't change the weight of it. In fact, I can even take that software and transmit it through the air. Software has no mass. Why is that relevant? Uh, because there's part of you that's not physical. The, the real you is software, not hardware. You can call it what you will, give it soul, spirit, use what vocabulary you like. Since it has no mass, it has no time dimension. Ooh. That means you are eternal whether you're saved or not. The problem is where are you going to spend it? If you're without defect, you can be in the presence of God. Other than that, you've got a big problem. I'll let you think about that a little while. Psychology doesn't deal with sin, only with one of its symptoms called guilt. And guilt is corrosive. Guilt is worth understanding. The literature that focuses on it is not, not a waste of time. The role of guilt in our person and in our subsequent behavior is well, but maybe not completely understood. It's a very, very corrosive factor in our makeup. But psychology can only deal with the symptoms, not the root cause. The root cause is a genetic imperfection called sin. Psychology does not have the vocabulary or the tools or the resources or even the, the, the perspective to deal with the cause. Fortunately, our genetic imperfections that we inherited from Adam have been dealt with by a love story. A love story written in blood on a wooden cross, erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. Taking our place, Jesus substituted his eligibility for our own. And that eligibility is now available for the asking. And I, and this may sound awfully basic, how we, because this is the roots that, that uh, Paul is going to lean on very heavily as we go forward here. So we'll continue in verse 15. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. And uh, so, see, much of this epistle is going to be a criticism of spiritual men. But we must, however, not become spiritual dictators in the lives of God's people. He's going to deal with that as we go forward, too. The source of wisdom is God, according to James 1.5, and his word, Psalm 199. 105 of 119. They are spiritually discerned. The speed that spirit judgeth how many things? All things. And by the way, that opens the door to what I think is one of the most interesting experiments you can conduct in your life. We like to think of, if we're scientific, we like to conduct an experiment and, and, and uh, test a hypothesis. I'm going to suggest an exercise that if you haven't done, I encourage you to give it a try. And that's to go to a stationery store and buy a journal, a blank book. It's not loose leave, it's sealed. 
and uh, make it a commitment that it's very, very private. Nobody is going to see what's in that journal but yourself. You do that so you can be candid with yourself. There's no pride here. And when you come across something in the Bible you don't understand, praise God for that confusion. Because I want you to go to that journal, put down the date and the reference, and try to put down in ink, not pencil, why it is you find that passage confusing. And try to capture your predicament that you don't understand the apparent contradiction or whatever is bothering you. Make a record of it. Then once you've done that, you've recorded that on that page, you take it to the Lord. Well, Father, I don't understand this particular passage. Take what you don't understand to Him and ask Him to clarify it for you. And petition that to the, in the name of and to the glory of Jesus Christ. And then watch what happens. It isn't going to happen necessarily in the next 10 seconds. It might not even be that day. But what is going to happen is you'll be reading somewhere something unrelated and the insight will come. Or you may hear something on the radio. Or you may overhear a conversation in a restaurant. Something will happen in your life that will cause that problem that you put in prayer to be suddenly clear. I want you to go back to your journal, find that page, put the date and describe how God, re what, how God revealed to you the key that unlocked that thing for you. You say, gee, that, that, I, I see what you're saying, Jerry, but why all the paperwork? I'll tell you why. As you go through and you encounter contradictions or confusions or things you don't understand, and you make that log, that will become a private treasure chest for you. Because the day will come when you'll go through the valley of doubt. The day will come when it'll get dark. The day will come when you'll wonder, have we gotten carried away with it all? And I want you to go back to that journal and you can see the footprints of the Holy Spirit as He carried you through those previous experiences. It will be a treasure chest unique to you alone. And it's something you don't share with others. They, won't really, they really won't understand. But it'll be a treasure that uh, is indescribable. Anyway, I challenge you to give that some thought. And uh, can you be taught the Holy Spirit? That's the question. And uh, so the idea of a private journal of your spiritual walk. Um, and then just watch him reveal himself. And I encourage you, if you're diligent in keeping a record, it will be a, an asset beyond measure. Let's move on. Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Wow. My wife has an eight session study on this very issue. On Be Transformed is the, the book title. And it's gone all over the world. It's uh, been one of the most treasured publications we have. Isaiah 40, 13, the mind of Yodhivav is the way it says it. The mind of Christ is the wisdom and power of God. But shifting here, now Jesus, the point is, is not a concept. He is a living person. And he is yearning. You know, I, I, one of the strangest uh, experiences I've had in recent months is coming to terms with the idea that Jesus has yearnings. I can't get over that. How can the Son of God, the all-powerful one that rules the, the universe, how can he have unfulfilled yearnings? The idea of that puzzles me. But he has yearnings. We know that from John 17. And his yearning is to have us with him. That's what he's yearning for. And by the way, when he does that, he has scheduled an audit. Oh, oh. He's scheduled an audit of our accounting of his calling for each of us. Ouch. Ouch. We're all talking about the harpazo, the rapture, call it what you will. Aye, here's the rub. What's the first thing that happens, not on the earth, with us up there? There's going to be a meeting. Everyone there is saved. Only saved are there. Are you ready for 2 Corinthians 5.10? That's a final exam. Ouch. 
The procedure that will be used, it, by the way, it's announced in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that we're all going to appear before the Bema Seat of Christ. And the Bema Seat is exactly what you think it is. It's the seat that Herod used. It's the seat that Pilate used. It's, a, it's the authoritative throne. People say it's just for rewards. It is this time here, but that's not the point. It's the, it's, it's the authoritative throne of the king. Are you ready for that audit? He's going to have an audit. And we are all going to have a final exam. Our salvation is not the issue. Jesus took care of that on the cross 2,000 years ago. Our salvation, the, the fact that we're there, demonstrates that we've, we're saved. Well, then what's the issue? Something that's not taught in church, generally. Most churches don't talk about rewards. Jesus talked a lot about rewards. We talk about inheritance. We don't talk much about that except in very fuzzy terms. That's what's at issue here. And one of the questions is, does your church teach and prepare you for that final exam? You're going to a final exam. Are you cramming for it? I am. The procedure that will be used will be detailed in our next session. We're going to get into the detail. And by the way, they're widely misunderstood. It's very clear in the text, but it's amazing how many people are confused about that whole issue. We're going to look at that in 1 Corinthians 3. So, but be careful as you study for next time. Don't confuse our responsibilities for fruit bearing with Jesus' complete work at Golgotha. Our salvation was paid 100% by our Messiah. You can't add to that. To try to add to that is blasphemy. What are we being measured by our fruit bearing? I'll use that term rather than works because works is a fuzzy, misused term. No, the fruit bearing. Have you borne fruit? The fruit that you've borne won't count. The fruit that the Holy Spirit was able to produce through you will count. And there's a difference. Many people teach about this, have little lists of things you should be able to do and don't do. They miss the point. Anything you come up to do is human works. No, 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 no. I go to Sunday school every, for 20 years, range the chairs. What, that's not what he's talking about. What has the Holy Spirit been able to do through you is the issue. Because the only fruit that counts is his fruit that he was able to accomplish through you. We need to understand that distinction. Because... The works are divided into two categories, that which is burned up and that which isn't. And the people that have uh, works that survive are rewarded. Wow. I thought everybody in heaven is equal. That's another myth that floats around the body of Christ that's just not true. There are lots of Jesus' parables that shred that idea. And he draws distinctions of all kinds. We want to understand that. So that's our thing. For the next session, I want you to read the entire epistle. It's not that long. Make that your goal between now and our next meeting. But study carefully chapter 3. That is a rich and yet widely misunderstood passage. Get into that. What are the key lessons in chapter 3 for us personally is the question. Who is present at the Bema Seat of Christ and what is involved? And when does that occur? That's your challenge to consider for next time. So with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer.